Banjo-Kazooie is a cherished childhood favorite of mine, which has recently become relevant once again, with Banjo and Kazooie's induction as a DLC fighting pair in Super Smash Bros. The original game on Nintendo 64 is a mostly family-friendly adventure, featuring the bird and bear duo, as they conquer the tower of the wicked witch Gruntilda, with the goal of rescuing Banjo's sister, Tootie, stolen away simply because of her beauty. Today, I'll be discussing how these misleading cartoony visuals can hide some genuinely scary secrets. Starting with the beauty transfer machine the envious hag plans on using to steal away Tootie's youthful appearance for herself. The player is actually able to see this come to fruition if they completely run out of lives, or exit to the title screen. While a helpless Tootie cries out for her brother and is transformed into a goblin-like creature, the once decrepit witch steps out, transfigured into a woman immediately desired by who's supposed to be one of the good guys, Mumbo Jumbo, the shallow, skull-headed shaman who rushes over to invite her back to his place, even though she's betrayed him in the past, by transforming her former teacher's face into this mask of horror, at least according to the instruction manual. An amazing touch I never really thought about is the fact that the two main instruments used in this game over ditty are a banjo and a kazoo, almost like the heroes are admitting defeat by begrudgingly and sorrowfully playing for her. Of course, we want to prevent that all from happening, so Banjo and Kazooie must collect magical jigsaw pieces and musical notes to solve the mysteries of the witch's haunt, and to break spells hindering their progress as they climb to confront Grunty at the top of her tower. So what kind of frightening traps and challenges await the bird and bear along the way? Well, the first two levels of Banjo-Kazooie, Mumbo's Mountain and Treasure Trove Cove, don't really consist of anything scary, and seem to outline the tone for the rest of the game, with one glaring exception being Snacker the Shark, who hunts you down if you trespass in his waters, while a Jaws-like theme plays in the background, of course. It isn't until World 3, Clanker's Cavern then, that a real change in atmosphere grins its golden metallic teeth. Comparatively, access to this stage requires getting the bear's paws dirty, quite literally, as the entrance is located in the underbelly of Grunty's lair. Dingy, dripping pipes and a swim through sewer water foreshadow what's to come. The world opens on an elevated, grimy platform where lungfish pop out of the walls, requiring the dynamic duo to dive into a cesspool with a toxic waste warning, and through an underwater tunnel where they'll be greeted with Grunty's living garbage disposal. At first glance, this shark-slash-whale hybrid seems to be a purely robotic beast, but fleshy scars on the side of its body and internal organs fused with metal seem to suggest that the thing was a fully organic creature before becoming this cyborg. It being used for waste is quite sad to imagine, and the fact that he's forcibly chained to the scummy depths of the cavern begging for fresh air makes for an emotional moment when he's eventually freed. Everything about the gameplay in this level is terrifying, too. Anytime there's deep diving far away from oxygen, it's accompanied with psycho strings. And then there's actually going inside of the monster, in a vein akin to Ocarina of Time's Jabu Jabu. <coughs> Pinkish tentacles called Whiplash are writhing organisms within, and look really gross, filling in an almost claustrophobic space. To top it off, mutant crabs wait inside one of the branching tunnels located behind Clanker. So whether it be the lurking cretins, the anxiety that comes with underwater levels and holding your breath, or the suffering Clanker himself, this is the most fearful the game ever gets. Three more mostly innocent levels, Bogland, Winter Holiday, and Desert Types, I said mostly innocent, as King Sandy Butt's maze is pure panic packaged into one song, follows suit before going back to the grim, with a haunted house stage and the revisiting of polluted waters with Rusty Bucket Bay. The former, Mad Monster Mansion, is definitely a classic horror homage, with your typical tropes galore, but that doesn't mean there isn't any genuine fear to be found here. Rusty Bucket Bay is more of what I already discussed with Clanker's Cavern, but the effects are not simply a result of it being a dedicated dump site. This is an actual shipyard, with dense, oily water that drains air even when Banjo keeps his head above it while paddling on the surface. Diving underwater is far worse, as it makes the gauge drop twice as fast. 
essentially guaranteeing the fact that you'll be seeing the pair's drowning animation at least a couple of times. It begs the question, what's worse, this or the team choking on toxic gas in the game's sequel? Despite its inhospitable properties, animals still live in this muck, with poor Snorkel the Dolphin trapped under the weight of a ship's anchor. The vessel itself seems to be in working condition, but the harbor is closed off so everything feels isolated. The level looks and feels dangerous, requiring careful platforming precision to navigate, especially when stepping over the acid pool and inside of the steamboat's engine room with deadly obstacles abound. The cold, large ship is effectively juxtaposed with the cartoon world, which sort of reminds me of that Spongebob episode featuring the hooks, these real objects in a stylized setting you're supposed to stay away from. Same feeling here where one wrong move is a vital mistake, though I'd say the fanged cowl ventilators make for a more intimidating baddie than these safety rafts with eyeballs. The stress in successfully clearing the level objectives is made worse on the Nintendo 64 version, where collectibles like notes are not saved if you don't collect them all in one go, and totally reset upon retrying the stage. Losing progress here is real horror. Jokes aside, the last dark aspect of the original game I want to talk about is the final boss battle with Grunty, testing all of the player's acquired knowledge throughout their quest. After a satisfying tumble with the self-described old cow, the mighty Jinjonator is revived by Kazooie's eggs, and repeatedly dive-bombs this beldam until her defenses fall and she plummets straight into the ground below. Much like a Disney death, a large boulder then collapses on top of and buries Gruntilda, where she remains trapped underground as a conscious yet slowly deteriorating corpse until Banjo-Tooie. Let's pour one out for her, shall we? Much like how Majora's Mask is the dark roast to Ocarina of Time's house blend, Banjo-Tooie does without the cream and sugar of Banjo-Kazooie as a straight shot of black espresso. Even as a kid, I picked up on just how grim the opening sequence is, and it's left somewhat of an impact on me since. I never finished the game until I reached adulthood, but even before that, I always remembered Tui in a somber light, and it's no wonder why. After reveal that Gruntilda is still alive as an animate skeleton, Bottles the Mole, your teacher companion in the first game is killed off immediately by a spell that destroys Banjo's home. The entire cutscene is moody. It takes place at night during a poker match, raining. The music is intense and turns into a depressing rendition of the cheery overworld theme from the last adventure. Seriously. Comparing the first five seconds of both games after taking control of Banjo is a stark difference. In the first game, you can turn right around and go back inside of his house to be treated with a lively setting. There's friendly faces looking back as portraits on the walls, and cozy furnishings with a fully stocked kitchen. In Tui though, there's nothing left. It's all charred, with a single scorched picture of the bear's sister crookedly hanging next to broken windows. Do you want some hints from the helpful bottles the mole to start your quest, just like in the original? Well, in Tui, that same Bottles is now a spirit hovering over his burned corpse, but it doesn't end there. So let me put this into context. This character in Banjo-Kazooie was standalone. He's the only mole around with no mention of a family. In Banjo-Tooie, the game that has him murdered at the very beginning makes it a point to introduce him as a family man. You'll first meet with his curious wife, wondering where her husband has gone off to. Banjo can't work up the courage to admit what's happened, so the entire game is played with the clueless woman furious that her spouse hasn't returned for dinner. This is part of what Masahiro Sakurai was talking about during the Banjo and Kazooie Smash presentation, when he referred to all of these characters in the games as poor souls. According to the cutting room floor, Bottle's Revenge is a dummied out but playable via hacking, two player competitive mode that was supposed to have the second player controlling the spirit of Bottle's turned evil. Devil Bottle's had the ability to possess enemies, encouraging that player to go against the other, to try and hinder their progress. Successfully landing a kill would result in the players swapping roles. It would have been a fight over who gets to play as the main characters. 
Getting back to what actually made it into the final release, it should be known that Bottles has two small children, Goggles and Specky. Both wonder where their papa is, and some honestly black humor comes into play when Kazooie tries to tell them he's been blasted with a fatal spell. With this all said, Bottles does revive at the end. I want to make that clear, but that does not change the fact that his fate isn't known until after the final battle. I never got there as a kid, so I had no idea for the longest time. The audience doesn't know that he comes back to life, so experiencing this blind for the first time is quite horrifying. Besides, his family circumstances never get any better. Mrs. Bottles doesn't believe that her husband died until he's backed up by King Jingling and forces him to eat an overcooked supper when he finally returns. By the time of Banjo-Kazooie nuts and bolts, there is a rumor that his wife took the children and left. When questioned, Bottles comes up with two conflicting stories. One is that they're still together, and she never left Jinjo Village, and the other is that she was mowed over and killed by Grunty. Whatever the case, they have a pretty messed up family life built on lies and distrust. Who knew I would ever say that about a fictitious family of moles? Furthering the topic of death that seems to surprisingly permeate Tui, in a similar shadow to Majora's Mask, several characters that do not revive are revealed soon after Bottle's passing when entering Jinjo Village. The Jinjos, if you remember from the original, are friendly NPCs to be rescued by Banjo, and were responsible for sending the sorceress plummeting to her two-year imprisonment beneath a boulder. In Tui, it's shown where the Jinjos live, a village where each family, one for every color, exists in harmony under the rule of King Jingling. Unfortunately, after being freed from her grave, Grunty disrupts this peace by driving a giant drill straight through their settlement. Each of the nine Jinjo families are scared away, and separated with their houses still standing, but a tenth building home to the Grey Jinjos, was completely demolished by the Hag. It can be presumed that the Grey Jinjos were the largest family, but they all perished as denoted by a signpost clearly outlining their fate. This isn't subtle. An entire family of friendly creatures were outright murdered on behalf of Grunty, and it's something the player can discover within the opening half hour of the game. As a now abandoned village, King Jingling is the sole inhabitant and the first victim for our skeleton antagonist's newfangled plan to absorb all organic life in the isle and restore her old body. The machine is called B.O.B., which was rare having fun with acronyms, as that can also stand for Battery Operated Boyfriend, with a blow and suck option to boot, which activates and drains the poor king until he's no longer of the living. He's a zombified ruler in a lifeless castle, with his poor pet reduced to a pair of eyeballs on a pile of ash. King Jingling's fate after Grunty's defeat is better than Bottle's, but it's still very much deserving of a Dark Aspect Award as again, <coughs> we're not even one hour into the game yet. In the seventh world, Hailfire Peaks, which is clearly similar sounding to Hellfire, we see three characters that either pass away on screen or have already died. Saberman is the latter an explorer frozen solid and without a pulse by the time he's uncovered, so fire eggs do not work in making him come too. Additionally, the father of an alien tribe falls from his high-flying saucer and dies upon hitting the ground. But more shocking is that one of his three missing children is found already dead and buried beneath a patch of ice. These characters are eventually revived through Mumbo's magic, but that's a whole lot of focus on dying in one E-rated title, especially in just one small area of a massive level. But those are accidental deaths. Let's get back to the topic of murder, shall we? Staying on the ice side of Hailfire Peaks is Mildred the Sentient Ice Cube, a friendly character the player is actually required to kill to 100% the game. Then there's her husband, George, who's stranded in Cloud Cuckoo Land and wants to be reunited with his wife who, unbeknownst to him, died by the fire eggs of a certain red-crested regal. The cutscene that ensues after quote-unquote helping him make it back home is best seen in its full, unedited glory. So get ready for the undisputed saddest death in Banjo-Tooie.
The title of Saddest Death would have gone to Royston, Banjo's pet goldfish, after being barbecued by Mumbo in the first game, and then trapped under a rock in Tui, but apparently this fish is immortal. Canary Mary of Glitter Gulch Mine is a character who almost died, because she was left behind by miners, who used her to check for poisonous gas, which was actually a thing coal miners did to save themselves from carbon monoxide, before proper detection tools were invented. If fumes were present in the mines, the bird would die from them much more quickly than any human would, giving the workers a chance to escape in time. At the end of the game, too, Grunty's equally naughty sisters meet a fate they don't come back from when crushed by a one-ton weight in the spirit of Monty Python. And their demise isn't met by the claws of Banjo. Gruntilda is the one that kills off two members of her own family, simply for losing at her Tower of Tragedy quiz. Grunty is relentlessly sadistic, and if squashing her own siblings wasn't enough to convince you of that, then you should know that her right-hand henchman, loyal enough to spend two full years trying to remove the boulder imprisoning Grunty, eventually quits working for the witch, because every time he loses to Banjo and Kazooie, he's physically beaten by her too, as punishment for failure, and comes back a little more battered and bruised for the next rematch. Banjo suggests that Klungo retire, and while at first he refuses, the goblin ogre troll finally realizes that, besides the complete lack of pay and vacation time, he can't take any more abuse from his boss, because he's become so disfigured already that apparently his wife won't want him anymore. Even though his injuries seem to have healed by the end of Tui, his beatings may have left permanent scars, as similar facial contusions and stitches are present even in Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, which takes place eight years later. This isn't the only time Gruntilda's minions have worked against her, either. Dingpot, her living cauldron that makes an appearance in both games, decides to help the pair out, because of how terribly he's treated by his master. Not only does she vomit in him and use him as a toilet, but apparently he once had a saucepan girlfriend and Grunty broke her handle. Backing up a bit to talk about a sillier enemy encounter is the boss Lord Wu Fakfak a self-important anglerfish based on a real person, Paul, a designer on Tui, who had a reputation for swearing and shouting, Woo! after figuring out a problem. With that said, you can now probably guess what Fak was inspired by. Language aside, this fight is visually disturbing, as it involves shooting and popping boils that actually bleed out. Later versions of Ocarina of Time censored Ganondorf coughing up blood to, uh, make him vomit, so why was Tui okay? Rising from the deep depths of Jolly Roger's lagoon takes us to a swimming hole next to Jolly's tavern that's polluted due to runoff from the abominable Grunty Industries. Trotty the Piglet was pushed into this wastewater as a prank and mutated as a result. He grew a third arm upon surfacing and expresses concern that he may also be growing a third leg. Considering all of the other innuendo rare slipped into these two games, it's clear that it isn't a leg he's referring to there. Nevertheless, the poor kid is sensitive about his arm, so naturally Kazooie takes advantage by yelling Freako. So brutal. Getting back to our main antagonist though, and that game show like endurance test the bony crone forces onto our heroes right before the final battle, we have the aforementioned Tower of Tragedy featuring a whole slew of dirty wrong answers, just like Grunty's Furnace Fun from the first adventure. Two of these joke answers notably pay homage to the fictional pirate captain Pugwash, a popular comic strip character in the UK turned animated television show in the late 50s, with a reboot that aired around the same time as Banjo-Kazooie. The first TV series was unfortunately subject to controversy, as some of John Ryan's characters supposedly had sexually suggestive names. These false accusations were the center of a legal dispute, ending with the creator successfully suing news reporters that outed him. They claimed characters like Master Bates and Roger the Cabin Boy, Roger being slang to have sex with, existed as part of his original work. The actual character names were Master Mates and Tom the Cabin Boy. Rare didn't seem to care about potential backlash or censorship at all though, so both of these names make an appearance in Tui, with a couple of original ones. 
Rear Admiral Brown Eye, and W Anchor, reading Wanker when put together. John Ryan must have been really upset his innocent creation was being plagued by rumors, these seeds of evil corrupting something good. Sort of like how some villain doppelgangers come to be. Now common in the world of video games, these mirrored characters typically sport the title Dark in front of their names. Rare of course took a different approach, and had a habit of giving mimics a lovely naming scheme of Minge. Minjos are rogue versions of Jinjos, and Minji Jonjo is a bad mumbo jumbo. Gruntilda's late sister's name is even Mingella. So after failing again to stump the player in a game of wits, Grunty is able to escape once more to the top of her new tower, where the mortal enemies do battle. This inevitably results in an explosion that leaves our poor villain in a lesser state than how she already fared, without even a bony body to walk around with, existing simply as a skull from this point on. How do the heroes celebrate a pathetic and no longer threatening Gruntilda? By playing keepy oppy with her detached head of course, which might have been inspired by Mesoamerican myth about the origin of the ritualistic real world Maya ball game, considering how much of Tui's first level was influenced by Mayan culture. Regardless, even as a coincidence, the scene at the end of Tui is slightly morbid. Her eyeball even falls out of its socket. Interestingly, when Banjo Tui was localized into Japanese, this scene was censored, likely to avoid the obvious decapitation depiction by replacing Gruntilda's head with a sack, seemingly made out of her own robe and scarf. This change is honestly a little more disturbing in my opinion, because her eyeball now rolls out of the bag when Banjo kicks it, implying that they all dismembered Grunty and stuffed her severed body parts into it. That's not the prettiest picture to end the video with, but this is Dark Aspects, and that's all I had to talk about for these games today. Thank you all for watching my re take on the original Banjo-Kazooie duology. If you want more content covering these games specifically, please be on the lookout for a proper Nintendo Innuendo episode tackling Rare's signature sneaky adult humor soon. A big thank you to my Patreon backers, as always, for helping this video come to light, and to my newest patron, Katie, if you also want to sign up and help support this channel, you can visit patreon.com slash thinggaming, where I post exclusive updates and behind the scenes content. See you all for the next video. Thank you.